who came from CDC, Annapolis State Health Departments. We have Maricopa County, um, Arizona, and Texas State Health Department. State Health Department here in the room. Um, so before we jump in, I wanted to just give some quick background. Um, NOAA has a comprehensive interagency MOU with CDC, and that provides a formal proper framework for us to further our collaborative efforts. There are three main thrusts of the MOU. It's to strengthen science and services to reduce environmental and public health threats, promote the efficient use of shared technologies and infrastructure, and to enhance the accuracy and timeliness and, in and integrated application of data and information to address public health issues. Since having the MOU, we've been really intentional in our efforts to identify opportunities for collaboration. Um, and NOAA, we have a NOAA One Health Working Group that's led by Julie Tartan and includes members from across the agency. That working group ties together health efforts across NOAA and links NOAA's efforts to other federal agencies with complementary skills, such as CDC. And several members of the One Health Working Group are engaged with CDC on a variety of topics. Here in the Weather Service, we have a Weather Service health team that leads into that One Health group, but also coordinates Weather Service-focused activities. That team is co-led by myself and Amy Martha Steiner, and there are about 10 of us on this team. We engage with CDC on routine and ad hoc data information sharing. We provide guidance on worldwide air quality capabilities. Um, we um, are working on an assessment of heat warnings and heat health related activities. And we, part, we share participation on storm assessment and survey teams. And we're also continuing to explore opportunities for jointly warning the public about weather related health hazards through an environmental service for um, an, an experimental service for joint emergency management. Management. Joint emergency messaging. Sorry about that. So um, that was just a bit of a background and sort of the lay of the land. And we're really excited to have Kate here uh, to share with us what she's been working on. I'll read her bio really quick and then hand it right over to Kate. So Kate is the Epidemiology and Data Services Program Manager for the Maricopa, Maricopa County Department of Public Health in Phoenix, Arizona. And in this role, she oversees a wide range of epidemiology functions, including heat-related illness, preparedness, and bioterrorism, unexplained deaths, community health assessments, chronic disease, and MCH epidemiology, and health economics, and ROI. Ms. Gooden has, has a master's degree in epidemiology and biostatistics from the George Washington University. So, Kate. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I would like to say that, um, you know, I am an epidemiologist by training and in background, and I definitely love working at the local health department. But the last couple of years that we've been able to engage through this cooperative agreement with both National Weather Service, NOAA, um, and CDC has been really um, educational for me to get a new perspective on kind of climatology and yeah, your approach to um, climate and health. And so it's been, I think, a really great partnership, and I really hope that you guys learn something from this as well um, that you can take back to your work. Um, and then, as you mentioned, Rebecca Miller is here, as well as David Zane from the Signal Department in Texas. And he also has some great experience with the methodology we're going to display here. Um, and so we really would like for this to be a conversation. So if you have questions or if the topic is particularly interesting, we'd be happy to explore it more than just what's on the slides. So again, we're going to go over um, a needs assessment that we recently did in Maricopa County using the CASPER methodology, um, and I'll go into what all that means um, in some of the slides. And it's originally designed for rapid needs assessments post-disaster, um, but we did it a little bit differently um, in Maricopa because it really wasn't post-disaster. It was really meant to be a proactive approach for needs assessment where we were looking at heat vulnerability as well as emergency preparedness topics such as sheltering, um, people with dependent needs, that type of thing so that we could be a little bit more proactive about how we allocate resources and how we prepare for some of these emergencies. Um, so again, for the outline of the presentation, I'm going to go over the background of who we are in Maricopa County, what do we typically do for heat-related illness, a couple of recent studies that we've done, um, and then move into why we chose the CASPER, how we applied it, and some of the lessons we learned. Um, so this is a map of Maricopa County, which is in Arizona. Um, it's about 60% uh, of the state's population resides in Arizona or in Maricopa County. Um, it's a lot of cities you've probably heard of, Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe, Mesa. Um, it is the fourth most populous county in the U.S., um, and it's second largest in land area. So if you can see kind of on the west side is a large um, area of um, reduced populations, mostly populated areas, rural populations. 
Um, and so Arizona is very hot. <laughs> um, our environmental temperatures there are greater than or equal to 100 degrees Fahrenheit um, as early as mid-May um, through the first week of October. Um, we average about 26 days, which is almost a month, um, where the maximum temperature is over 110 degrees. Um, and we have um, a lack of overnight cooling a lot as well. So we have around 13 days where the minimum temperature is still over 90 degrees. So since 2006, Maricopa County has implemented a system for tracking heat-associated deaths, um, which is where kind of our main focus has been for the past few years. Um, so we have an ongoing real-time mortality surveillance activity where we um, work very closely with our medical examiner as well as our Office of Vital Registration to look at um, any death that could potentially be heat associated. All of those are required to go to the medical examiner's office as a non-natural cause of death. Um, and we uh, assist them with kind of sifting through maybe missed cases where a physician didn't report it, um, that type of thing. Um, we also have worked extensively with the scene investigators to collect information on the, in, on the um, internal air temperature if it was an indoor death, um, as well as supplemental information about whether the uh, person had air conditioning in their home, whether they were actually using it. And if they weren't using it, why not? Was it that it was broken? Was it personal choice? Um, and a lot of that comes from both observation as well as interview with the, um, the next of kin. Um, and so that's really where a lot of our intensive case finding effort is, but there's this large pool of morbidity information that we don't really know a lot about. Um, we use hospital discharge data, but that's um, at least six months delayed, so it's not really a real-time surveillance system that we could use on an ongoing basis. We mostly do it for retrospective studies. Um, and we do hope to get more real-time data through the CDC's effort um, to roll out Biosense 2.0, which is a syndromic surveillance system for chief complaint data in emergency departments and urgent cares. So once we get that up and going, we really hope that it will be a more real-time surveillance system. But we really saw that we have this huge gap um, in knowledge of what's going on beyond these deaths. Um, so again, this is kind of where we sit with our heat-associated deaths. So we have been going down. 2014 is as, um, a little bit higher than 2013, but still not over 100. And then for 2015, unfortunately, we've already had our first heat-associated death. Um, there was a child in a um, hot car um, that has already happened. It was about a week ago. Um, and so then, again, we, really fo we have been focusing on mortality surveillance. And so this is just one snapshot of the place of injury. And so we definitely understand a lot of the risk factors for outdoor deaths. But what are the risk factors for indoor deaths? So you can see in one year, over 40% of our deaths occurred indoors. Um, and then we were wondering more about those deaths. So you can see that over 87 or 87% 87 of indoor deaths had air conditioning, but it was off. So what's driving these people from not taking the steps that they need to take to protect themselves? Um, and so 58% of those had a non-functioning air conditioner. So again, what are the barriers? Is it a resource issue? Is it a knowledge issue? You know, where are we missing these people that have a very easy intervention? Um, so again, we were wondering about how do we understand these risk factors, um, and then how do we develop effective interventions for these communities um, when we don't really know that much about them right now. So one of the first steps we took was um, an evaluation of the cooling centers that exist um, in the Phoenix metro area. So Cooling centers are um, a little bit different in Arizona than they are in some locations. They're open the entire heat season. They don't have hours set. They open typically the first week of May and then go again until like probably the end of September, beginning of October, it depends on how hot it actually is. Um, they're also called heat refuge stations. Um, in Arizona, they're totally voluntary. It's a coalition started by the city of Phoenix, um, and they started this coalition called the Heat Relief Network. There's, depending on the year, 50 to maybe almost 70 of these open. Um, a lot of them are senior centers, community centers. Some of them are municipal buildings that just allow people to sit in their lobby. But basically, they're an opportunity for these people who are either homeless, um, who don't have resources to run their air conditioning during the day, whatever, um, to access a cooled environment without you know, feeling uncomfortable, like you know, loitering or um, impeding business of a commercial location or something like that. Um, so last summer we did an evaluation of these um, and we did several different types of surveys. So we wanted to understand not only who is using them,
but what was driving these facilities to participate with the idea that then we could perhaps recruit additional facilities. Um, so we interviewed all the center managers, and then we did a visitor survey. So there were um, paper surveys available at the check-in desk for these, um, and we asked the managers or the people at the desk to give them to the visitors. They only filled out one per season. Um, and it had a lot of information on it about, you know, were they homeless, um, what was driving them to visit the Pulling Center, how long did they stay there, how many times did they visit, what resource needs did they have. So there was a list of things that they could check if they were, you know, needing a certain resource. And this was a partnership between the County Health Department, our State Health Department, Environmental Health Office, um, and ASU. Um, so again, drivers of participation, we looked at demographics, household information, and then we did an observational study where we actually went out and visited all these facilities and took pictures to know were they handicap accessible, did they have signage, and actually one of the big gaps we saw was that there actually isn't very effective signage in many of these places, um, that there's not really, like you, you've all seen those safe place signs that are really recognizable, they're really well um, established and what they mean, and there's really nothing like that for these heat refuge stations. Um, so just briefly, we had 685 visitors that responded to the survey, which was actually really good um, as far as, you know, getting a survey response for a voluntary process. Um, and uh, I just wanted to snapshot this because this was a question that um, the local weather office requested be added through ASU. Um, and it was how people were hearing about excessive heat warnings. Um, so the majority from television, um, word of mouth, radio, internet. Again, this is slightly different than the same question we asked on the Casper survey. And you'll notice that for this one, word of mouth comes in second above radio and internet. And I think that's really related to the types of people um, that are visiting these centers um, who generally don't have resources of the internet or a computer at home. Um, so we then thought about what are our next steps. So when we were at the cooling centers, we were really only capturing the visitors of cooling centers. And really, the people that are probably most vulnerable to heat-related illness are people who don't know that there's these resources out in the community. So how do we reach them? What are our real drivers for wanting to continue this research? Um, one of the big things we wanted when we started discussing this was we wanted it to be something community-wide. We didn't want it to be you know, a special population or some small area. We really wanted it to be some sort of first kind of first blush research of what's going on in our community so then we could start driving hypothesis for further study. Um, and then we also wanted to tie it in with the cooling center evaluation to try and give us some context for what we were seeing about these special populations. Okay. So again, we want it to be community-wide, we want it to be representative. One of the things that we really, um, I guess, mentally wanted was for it to be methodologically sound, but we weren't quite sure how we wanted to go about that. You know, we have our expertise in surveillance, so case counting and things like that, but, you know, when we start looking at research studies, how do we make it something that will be translatable to other jurisdictions, that will be meaningful to the scientific community, that people will have um, kind of faith that it really is sound information that we're putting out there. We definitely considered a lot of different things, whether we wanted to do some internet surveys, um, whether we wanted to do focus groups, whether we wanted to do passive surveys. Um, so there are a lot of places that we know people congregate that are not cooling centers, like libraries and malls, things like that. So did we want to try that? Um, did we also want to do active survey collection, where maybe we went out on the street and handed out surveys? So we considered all of those, um, but then after discussing several of our colleagues as well as CDC, we decided on the CASPER methodology. And we can talk about why we did that. So CASPER is the Community Assessment for Public Health Emergency Response. Um, so that's a mouthful. Um, but it's a rapid needs assessment methodology. And like I said before, it's typically used post-disaster, uh, but we really wanted to see if it was applicable and really feasible in a non-disaster situation. Um, it can quickly identify health, medical, and environmental needs in the community that you survey. It's household level information, and that'll come into play later. Um, so it's not about an individual. Individuals respond for all the members of their household. Um, and there's a lot of strength in that, but there are also some weaknesses in that process. Um, so the method is it's a two-stage cluster sampling process where you identify 30 clusters within your community, and then you survey seven houses 
within each of those clusters. So then ideally that will leave you with 210 surveys, but the minimum is an 80% response rate, which is 168 surveys. Um, and 80% is pretty standard for most survey response rates to really feel comfortable with the results you're getting. Um, typically the cluster, if you will, is a census block. Um, and then you go door to door in a structured manner, like I said, until you get those seven houses. Um, so again, the advantage of this is it was meant to be disaster related. The two-stage cluster sampling really gives you a representative sample of your population without having to do so many interviews. Um, and it was a really established methodology that we felt comfortable adopting within our community. Like I said, um, there are some limitations of it being household-based versus individual-based. Um, that also leads to some problems with comparisons across populations, um, as well as some limitations on how much you can drill down into your data. Um, also, when you're considering doing this, um, the underlying populations need to be relatively homogenous. So you're looking at um, homogenous as far as the storm damage. So if you're like looking at a tornado, you want to make sure that you're serving people with the same level of damage and you're not mixing your populations. Um, as well as this last point, which was critical for us, which is the nature of the jurisdictions who are responding to the needs identified. So you don't want to also survey people where you can't provide any assistance because you're, well, you're, you're, just, you're collecting data that you can't actually do anything about. And in public health, we don't really like to do that. Um, and then one of the things that we found in working through our preliminary results is sometimes because you're doing um, structured sampling, you can weight your data and represent your whole population, but then that does create some questions from the public about how do you actually message this? It's like, well, you only surveyed this many people, but you know, you're making assumptions about the whole community. And it's just a challenge for you to think about with the messaging. So this is how we implemented it in Maricopa County. This is our overall timeline. And this is actually a really long timeline um, for most CASPers. Most CASPers are done within like a couple of weeks, but like I said, this was not um, post a disaster, so we weren't under the same time crunch. Um, we had more time to be thoughtful about our survey and how we wanted to collect the information. And again, some of it was us figuring out if this was the methodology we wanted to use. And then also, this happened to be when we were having the Super Bowl in Phoenix. So we, in Janu at the end of January and beginning of February, we had the Pro Bowl at the end of January. We had the Waste Management Phoenix open that same week, and then the next weekend we have the Super Bowl. And so it was, that was our big priority. Um, we also happened to have a community-wide measles outbreak at the same time. So <laughs> there was a lot of stuff going on, which did delay some of the planning. Um, and it did actually push out our survey by like three weeks probably. Um, one of the reasons we decided um, on this time frame though was we really wanted it to be as comparable to our cooling center evaluation as possible, and we wanted to reduce recall bias. Um, so we were trying to get a time frame when it could still be applicable to the summer of 2014, which is when we did the cooling center evaluation. So that's kind of how we ended up with the time frame we did. Um, so one of the things that you have to think about, or we had to think about, was how did we actually want to do the sampling for this? So we didn't have a disaster to really confine what we were looking at. So we could go as big as we wanted, but that provides some challenges. So this was one of the first maps that one of our interns put together. And this is heat morbidity. It's a point density map. Um, and I guess I should have put some landmarks on here. But the large gray area is um, Central Phoenix, Peoria, Glendale, out to Sun City. And then all the way on your right-hand side is downtown Mesa. So. When I looked at this, I was like, oh, well, we obviously have these two kind of epicenters of heat mortality or morbidity. Um, do we want to figure out what's different about them? Or do we want to know just in general what causes heat vulnerability? Um, and then we started to think, well, maybe we should do more than one Casper. We should try two different sampling frames. So let's try two different sampling frames within these two high incidence areas. Well, then like I said, due to some of the limitations about how you can compare the data and how you can stratify the data, that really wasn't going to get us what we wanted because now you're comparing a high area to a high area. So is that really the best bang for our buck? So we thought about um, doing rates as well. So we weren't just going to look at number of cases. We wanted to look at the rate to account for the underlying population. So this is, again, heat morbidity, so it's hospitalizations per 100,000 population by zip code. 
And you can see, well, you may not be able to see, but so this area, I'm standing up, sorry for those of you on the left. So, oh, yeah, so, So this area is central Phoenix, which was that kind of high morbidity area from our point density map. And then this area over here is downtown Mesa, which was that second area of high morbidity, um, just by point density. But you can see that obviously that's where our population is. And so when you look at the rates, you're not seeing the same kind of areas lighting up, um, which definitely makes sense, obviously. Um, higher population areas are going to have higher counts of your disease. Um, and then again, we wanted to be able to compare in high morbidity areas, what were the characteristics or risk factors we see in those areas compared to the low? Um, so we did move forward and decide to do two different clusters. So we decided to divide up the zip codes into those that are high morbidity and low morbidity. And again, this was after consultation with the environmental studies branch. And we cut it off. So these are quartiles. These are even quartiles. And so we divided it up at those less than 100 hospitalizations per 100,000 people and then above. Um, so again, yeah, so we walked through, we received TA from CDC on this process. Were there any differences in the vulnerability? We said yes, there probably are, so we wanted to do the two sampling frames. Then again, we looked at were the underlying populations homogenous? Yeah, they were, mostly. Um, were there jurisdictional differences? And again, I mentioned that this was important for us, um, so we did say that yes, there are some jurisdictional differences. So if you look at this high morbidity area over here, these two high morbidity areas, those are both Indian reservations. Um, and also these areas over here are Indian reservations. So we have no jurisdiction there. It would be a lot of a process administratively to get approval to even go onto the reservation. Also, we're not the health authority there. They have their own tribal health authority. So, you know, isn't it is it really our place to be doing this? We decided after this whole thought process to exclude those tribal areas. Um, and then we also ex uh, excluded the extremely rural outlying areas simply because the number of homes there would never have gotten us the number of surveys that we needed in those areas. Um, so then the CDC did provide us with maps of each census block that was selected, so by clusters. Sure, go ahead. I have a question. You talked about Indian reservations. You said that the underlying population was demographically not homogenous. Yeah, so sorry, after we, we excluded the tribal things first okay. based on jurisdiction and then looked at the high and low clusters after that, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, so CDC provided us with the census block maps, um, number of housing units per each cluster, and then they provided us those maps in several different formats. Um, so they were GIS readable, web readable, um, and then PDF forms. So how did we actually operationalize this? Um, we did not stand up a true ICS. Does anyone know what ICS is? The Incident Command Structure. So it's a methodology for incident management that came from fire and EMS that public health has, has adopted over the past few years as an effective management tool for responding to disasters. Um, and it has very prescriptive job descriptions, titles, hierarchies that really help you manage, especially ongoing disasters, uh, because you can easily plug people into different roles and they know what's expected of them and they have resources available to them. So we didn't actually activate an ICS, but we did use the mock ICS structure for uh, operationalizing this and rolling this out because in reality, if this was post-disaster, we would have used ICS. So we did activate three branches of ICS, planning operations and logistics. Um, Mostly the pre-event activities were managed by MCPH staff. Mostly it was out of my office, epidemiology, as well as our sister office, the Office of Preparedness and Response, and it was about eight people. We do have a CDC career epidemiology field officer who is stationed at the State Health Department, and she had recently responded to the Napa earthquake where they did a CASPER, and so she provided a lot of TA for us on lessons learned from the field there. Um, and we met weekly for one month beginning in February um, after the Super Bowl. <laughs> um, so we, this is how we divided things up. So the planning section developed the survey. Again, we wanted both a heat focus as well as a preparedness and emergency planning focus. We wanted it to correlate at least somewhat with our cooling center evaluation questions as far as the tone of the language so that we could try and compare them. Um, and then we received review and input from both the CDC, so these branch, 
our state health department colleagues, other partners like um, Arizona State University and some others. Um, they also determined what education materials we were going to send out with the teams when they interviewed the people. And then they were responsible for coordinating training of staff and volunteers. So as far as the survey that they developed, um, there's a pretty established list of questions that other CASPers have used. And we tried as much as possible to reuse those questions and not reinvent the wheel. There was no real reason for us to do that. Um, so the demographic section was pretty standard to what other CASPers have used. Um, we looked at risk perception as far as preparedness, as far as, you know, what do people see as their top three risks um, for emergencies in the community. We looked at whether they had underlying disabilities or barriers to evacuation. Um, we looked at how could they access assistance for themselves, so like where was the nearest person they could call in an emergency, how would they access services that we provided, and then barriers to communication, so you know, do they not have a cell phone, are they hearing um, or vision impaired. Um, then we added a section about the knowledge of heat stress, so do they, have they ever heard of excessive heat warnings, do they know symptoms of heat illness, um, have they experienced any heat illness episodes, we then looked at coping mechanisms for the individual. So how do they cool their home? Are there barriers to cooling their home? And knowledge of assistance programs. And then we looked at neighborhood level coping mechanisms, such as community resources and knowledge of cooling centers. So then the operations section was really tasked with looking at how many staff were needed, um, recruiting those staff, uh, looking at the clusters that were selected to be part of the survey, so did they represent gated communities? Um, were they large areas of snowbirds where we weren't going to have that many people who were able to respond to a survey? Were there any neighborhoods that were maybe a security issue? And then we did try and identify ahead of time areas where we knew there was a large proportion of Spanish-only speakers, um, and then appropriately assigned staff to those areas. Um, they were also responsible for liaising with the sheriff and police, one, to make them aware that we were going to be in the community, and two, have a plan of action in case there were security issues. Um, they then assigned out the clusters to the field teams, managed the field teams, and managed the data entry process. Then logistics, um, which is often forgot about, but one of the most important groups, because they have all the money. <laughs> um, they looked at what equipment was available to us, like did we need radios, do we have smartphones we could loan out, did we need tablets, did we need GPS equipment of any kind, um, what would we actually have available to provide to our volunteers, so how did we procure water, how did we procure snacks, what other supplies did we need, um, and then how would we pay back staff expenses to people who this is kind of outside of their original job duties. So this is how we did that. Um, so to recruit volunteers, we used Qualtrics, which is an online survey tool. We distributed it to our internal staff, to the state health department, uh, faculty, and distribution lists at universities to request student participation. We did send it out to our medical reserve corps, our disaster volunteer distribution list, which is maintained by our Office of Preparedness and Response. And then the state did also send it out to other local county health departments um, who might be interested in participating. In all, we had 67 survey respondents, um, and this was kind of how they were broken down. The majority were from our office and preparedness and response, which is kind of what we expected. Um, but we did get 10 state health department employees, 12 university staff or students, um, six from healthcare organizations, which came through that volunteer list. Um, and then we ended up actually using 64 of these staff. Of course, we were doing it over a long period of time, and so not everyone was available at all the time. Um, so again, we had these two sampling frames of both high and low vulnerability, um, but we wanted to assign, so Maricopa County is a huge area, we showed you the map earlier, and it's geographically dispersed, as well as the clusters were geographically dispersed. So part of what we did during the volunteer survey was ask them their home zip code so that we could then assign them to clusters that were nearest to their home zip code so they weren't having to travel, you know, 45 minutes to an hour in order to get to the location. Um, and this is different than what Casper has done in the past, um, because usually they have one muster point, and then so not all the volunteers. We had field team leads um, who set up their own muster points at in an area similar to where their clusters were. The teams met there, and then they deployed. Um, 
So again, the field team leads identified those rally points. They monitored their field staff. Um, we checked in and checked out equipment daily. Um, and then they returned those surveys nightly for data entry the following day. So our total response period was March 24th through the 28th. Um, everyone who volunteered to do survey collection had to take a required training. It was about three hours. Um, we offered it four different times, beginning on the 24th, and we did receive um, on-site TA from the CDC, um, so we had a staff member from them uh, come and present the training and help us with those field team management pieces. Um, we were actually in the field the 25th, 26th, 27th, and 28th. Um, I only mentioned that because we originally were only planning on being in the field for three days. So the 25th and 26th, that's Wednesday and Thursday, um, we collected so few interviews on those two days that we had to add the Friday, um, which was disheartening for people. <laughs> but, but it was an on-the-fly decision. We knew it needed to get done. Um, and then the teams that went out on that Friday were much smaller. It was mostly only internal staff. We didn't send it out to the other volunteers. And it was basically, when you can go, find a partner, tell us where you're going. And it was a little bit less organized. <laughs> um, but our biggest day was Saturday, um, 10 to 5 PM. Um, so the outcomes, we ended up knocking on over 1,000 doors. Wow. <laughs> um, we collected 168 interviews. So remember that the minimum for this is 168 interviews. We hit exactly 168 in the high incidence areas. So that represented a contact rate. So of the number of doors, how many people did you actually talk to um, of 34%? And then of those people that were actually home, 54% of them actually respond to the survey. So um, once we actually got someone to answer the door, that we were pretty good at getting them to actually respond. Again, mentioning before, one of the big issues was we do have a lot of snowbirds, especially if this is still March, remember, and so most people don't go home until like April or May. Um, and so a lot of the clusters were in areas that are known to be predominantly retirement communities, and so that was a huge problem for us. Um, and then we got 169 in the low incidence areas. Um, and again, it's a very similar context and cooperation rate. So I just wanted to go over just a few of the highlights. Um, we used epi 7 for both data entry and analysis. This is just preliminary results. Um, these are weighted results, so because it is a structured sampling, you get a lot more representation of your community, but you do have to weight the data. Um, just, I don't remember how I refer to all of these throughout the rest of the slides, so if you ever see high, that means high incidence area, and low means low incidence area. Um, at this point, we haven't done any crosstabs or significance testing, um, and we are exploring further analysis. So these are just a couple of highlights that I thought you guys might be interested in, but if you have questions about the other things that we talked about, I'd be happy to talk through the, some of those that I remember. Um, but if you look at, we actually do have a lot of people with air conditioning, which is not surprising. I mean, Arizona is extremely hot. That's what we found in many of our other surveillance systems. And you really don't see a big difference between those in the high and the low. Um, I will say that if you look in the high areas, about 20. 4% of households indicated that the cost of electricity was a large barrier for them actually using their air conditioning. And then it's slightly lower in the low area. We do have um, confidence intervals around these two percentages, and they don't overlap. So we do know that there is a significant difference between these two. Um, and so then this is the percentage of households who recall hearing an excessive heat warning during the past summer. So this actually was very, this was a pleasant surprise that almost 80% of the populations in Maricopa County remember hearing excessive heat warnings. Um, and you can see, though, that the people who say no are slightly higher in the high morbidity areas. Um, and there's a slide, maybe it's the next one. No. Um, there's a slide in here about how um, you'll see that the population who are Spanish-only speakers is much higher in the high morbidity areas. Um, so then this is of those that said, yes, they had heard of an excessive heat warning, how did they hear about it? Um, so again, this is correlating with that cooling center question that we asked that I mentioned earlier, where word of mouth was a lot bigger for the cooling center visitors than it is here. So TV is top, radio, then internet. I mean, you can see a slight difference between how people are hearing about these messages between the high and low. So TV is much higher in the low areas, radio is the same. And then you see an increase in both text messaging and social media in the high morbidity groups. 
And again, most of these confidence intervals do not overlap. So this is what I was talking about. Okay. So this is percentages of households um, with at least one adult who does not speak English. So you can see a really big difference. It's, again, the scale is not 100%. It's at 16%. Um, but you see a large difference between those in the high morbidity areas and those in the low morbidity areas. Um, so then we asked about heat, illness, knowledge. So can you name some symptoms that you could get from exposure to excessive heat? It's kind of how we phrased it. And it was an open-ended question. And literally whatever they said, we wrote down. Um, and at the time did not say any judgment or provide any education back to them about because we had other questions after that about symptoms. Um, and so if you look in the high morbidity areas, 36% um, of people could not name a single correct symptom of heat-related illness. And this is my subjective categorization of correct. Um, that's why it's in quotation marks. Um, but it's things like they mentioned asthma exacerbations only, like they would, they would say only asthma, or they would mention only like light-related ones, like sunburns. Um, if they got anywhere near, I gave them credit. <laughs> so this is actually probably underestimates of people who aren't aware of correct heat-related illness symptoms. And then that's compared to only 18.3% in the low morbidity areas. So there's something going on here about people maybe not recognizing the symptoms of exposure to excessive heat. Um, so the common symptoms listed are here. The ones with asterisks next to them are the ones I considered not correct. Um, so again, it was mostly light-related ones, um, and then I did give them correct. I did the, give them credit if they said heat stroke or heat exhaustion, even though those are more of a syndrome, not symptom. But I still gave it to them. Um, so like I said, this is actually probably an underestimate of the correct heat knowledge um, within our community. Um, and so then this was the follow-up question where we did give them some specific symptoms of heat illness and say, did anyone in your family experience these in the last year? Um, and 40% of those in the low and 30% of those in the high say yes. So this is some area that we need to explore a little bit further about, you know, why are we seeing self-reported symptoms of heat illness higher in the low morbidity areas than what we're seeing for hospitalizations? Um, so where is the disconnect between um, maybe them managing at home versus going to an ED and getting into our record system somehow. Um, and then the, we asked them if, they, if a family member experienced a heat-related illness episode, how did they manage it? Um, and this was a discrete list of options. It was either manage it at home, they called 911 only, um, visited an ER only, or were admitted to the hospital, or death. We actually had no reports of death, which is good. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but the vast majority, you can see here, just manage it at home. I mean, and I was in the field doing the law of the surveys, and that's really what we got a lot was, oh, it's not a big deal. We could just manage it at home. We just sit around the air conditioning and drink water. That's basically how everyone reacted to that question. Like, it really didn't occur to them this, that it was a serious condition and that they needed to potentially talk with someone about it. Uh, okay, so then one of the other questions we asked about was maybe, you know, how can they access additional community resources? So um, this is the percentage of households in Maricopa County who leave their home to go to an air-conditioned place to cool off. Um, and you can see the vast majority said no, which was what we anticipated. Um, but I was a little bit concerned that more people in the high morbidity areas said yes, they do leave their home. Um, and so it's like they are conscious that this is a risk and they're taking some step to access another resource, but we're not seeing that as an improvement in their health. So what is going on here? Do you have any data as to whether people who are leaving their home had air conditioning? Um, so we can look at that because it's all one survey, so we will be able to look at that. We just haven't yet. I think that's a great point. Um, and we asked them where they went. Um, so disheartening to me, no one said they went to a cooling <laughs> Not a single person went to a cooling center. Um, a lot of people went to what we, again, know anecdotally are some of the default places. So a mall, library, a movie theater. Um, most of the things that fell into other were um, like they would go to, a, um, go to work or go to a swim park, something like that, community pool. Um, so... 
And then we asked them about had they ever, after we asked them where they went, which included a cooling center, we then asked them if they explicitly knew of a cooling, knew what cooling centers were. And so only 78% of people in high morbidity areas had ever heard of cooling centers compared to over 80% in a low. Um, so again, these did not have overlapping confidence intervals. Um, and then only of those 78% uh, that knew where a cooling center was, only 2.6% in the high morbidity areas actually knew where a cooling center was. So like they had anecdotally heard of it or word of mouth heard of it or something, but they don't actually know how to get there, where they are, where to access this information. And that's even, that was even lower in the low percentage um, communities. So as far as our whole process overall, um, we had some challenges. Um, so a huge challenge was actually coordinating the volunteers. Like I said, this is not post-disaster, so everyone was at work at their day job. There were no office closures. There were no disruption in services. People were just going about their regular life, and we were asking them to do this on top of that. And so actually getting the volunteers um, to sign up for multiple days, figuring out the training, that definitely was a challenge. Um, heat, it, so it ended up actually being 95 degrees out on Saturday when we were trying to do this heat survey, so that was a very big challenge and we really didn't want to have this story on the news about someone getting heat exhaustion. We're trying to figure out about how people get heat exhaustion. Um, we really felt that we should have started recruitment and contact with our field workers sooner, so like I said, I think mentally we were just a little bit blocked because we had Super Bowl, we had all these other like critical activities going on, and in our mind this was just, oh, that's next month, that's next month. And in reality, we probably should have started this volunteer coordination sooner. Um, we did end up having several gated communities, and actually most of them we were able to overcome getting permission to come in, but one refused to the degree that they hired a lawyer. And we just skipped that, uh, skipped that one. Um, and then again, I mentioned it before, the snowbirds are a challenge for us um, because they're actually not here during the summer or not in Arizona during the summer, so they're not at the same risk um, as the community that lives there over the summer, so we didn't want to include them in our analysis, um, but they are everywhere in Arizona, and so it was really hard for us to actually get um, enough people to answer the door who weren't snowbirds. Um, like I said, we had a low response rate on the first two days, so we did add that third um, or that fourth day on that Friday. Um, again, when you're thinking about this, you know, if you consider doing this in the future, um, you really need to find people who are good salespeople because some people are really comfortable talking to other people, and some people just aren't, and that's okay. You need to acknowledge that because once you put them into the field, if they're not comfortable with it they're going to get less comfortable with it. And then they'll get frustrated because they're not getting surveyors. We had a couple of people like that where they aren't really good at it, so then they don't get responses. So then they feel bad about themselves. So then they get, <laughs> it, just, it like turns into this cycle. And, um, and you, we sent them out in pairs, which is the standard recommendation for safety reasons. Um, and that's okay too. I mean, you can have people who aren't the best salespeople be the note taker, or be the tracking form filler outer. And it just really, was up to the team dynamics to kind of figure out who was the better person for the recruitment piece and who should maybe just be an observer. And you know, after that first day, most of the teams figured that out pretty quickly. Um, so successes, I mean, I think that this really was a good community partnership for us. Um, it, we got to work with our Medical Reserve Corps, we got to work with a lot of um, student volunteers in the community. Both our own employees as well really enjoyed actually getting out, talking with people, seeing the community that they're serving, seeing areas of the community they've never been to before. I mean, that really, I heard a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, and then again, it strengthened partnership both with our heat relief network, with our city governments. Um, they really appreciated that we were doing this. Um, and we did not have any security issues, so the sheriff's office was really concerned that we were going into these bad neighborhoods. But we had no security issues. We did have a dog bite. <laughs> Um, and I was talking with my staff, and I'm like, I'm not sure if it's better or worse that it was one of our own staff that got the dog bite. Um, it's what probably, happened? Okay. Um, so uh, this pair um, was doing, um, so I don't know if you know about Maricopa County, of a lot of stray dogs, like wild dogs are a common thing, um, even in the city. Uh, and they were doing interviews, and they were getting back in their car, and a dog had hidden 
under the car. And so when she went to open the door and sit down, then her leg was like right at the level of the dog's face. So a puncture on that side. Okay, and that's it. So thank you very much. Well, like I said, Rebecca and David are here. David's done several of these Casper's in Texas. Maybe he wants to talk about what his experience is like. We're really sort of here to answer your question. Sure. Uh, this is David Zan with the uh, State Health Department in Texas, and I applaud uh, your work, Kate, for the CDC. I'm looking at this. In, in Texas, at the State Health Department, we support our regional and local health departments. So we've got a number of these in response to weather events. So just last weekend, we were in one community that is recovering from a terrible wildfire. Uh, we've done these in response to hurricanes. Um, and we're really interested in doing it in response to, to drought and other types of weather events. But CASPER is a very flexible method uh, that can get, that can provide uh, really good information that can be acted upon. So we're really delighted of your interest in, in uh, Rebecca? Yeah, yeah, no, I, and I think one of the things that and we've talked about this with Michelle, the opportunity when you do your, your um, field assessments, because it's a, you know, especially partnering with the, with the local public health department, because a lot of them have been trained, but given the fact that they typically go out, collect data within a, um, a day or, well, it's usually two or three days, and then you can turn around and have actual data within 24 hours, and that's what our office does, but it's, you know, the sampling isn't really, it, it, it's really thinking through the yeah. sampling. It's, mm -hmm. The sampling's not hard. We have, a, we have a tool to do that. But thinking about what mm -hmm. questions you want to ask and what do you want to know. And, and it's very interesting yeah. to see, you know, what you did. Yeah. I mean, I would agree. I think that the, I mean, the CDC staff did offer to train us on how to do the sampling ourselves. Um, and we do have the guidebooks to do that. But, not to obligate you. but I mean, they were really helpful. I mean, it was done in, like, four days. We got all the maps back. And it's a lot because it's 30 individual maps and, like, several different formats. But right. it was pretty quick turnaround yeah. on all of that. But I would say that, yeah, that wasn't our biggest challenge. The biggest challenge was, um, yeah, deciding on the survey questions um, and then deciding on some of the implementation pieces mm -hmm. as far as were we going to do field team leads or were we not. Um, in our, we, we just decided that that was the best methodology for us, again, because if you were driving out from Apache Junction to the central office, it would take you probably 55 to 60 minutes to get there just to muster and then return back to Apache Junction. So you're already losing two hours of field time for that. Um, and so that ended up being the best method for us, but it also came with its own challenges. I mean, so, you know, if it was a much more prescribed area, I don't think we would have that anymore. Interesting discussion. Yeah, and we did this with North Dakota because there was, they had uh, looked at their, their extreme cold warnings and just uh, with the local public health department, with the weather forecast office, um, ask questions. The, the, the value is you're asking door to door. You're asking people. You're not asking, you know, if you're putting those questions on the National Weather Service website, the only people are answering those questions are people that are interested in, in weather. Yeah. All right. So why don't we take some questions? Um, we have some online. No, I was just wondering if you wanted me to still unmute people. Do you want me to raise their hand and I can unmute them one by one? Or they can just type in a question into the chat box if they want. And yeah. I can read it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we um, have them type in a question in the chat box, and then we'll go around the room to see if anyone has questions while folks are typing. So any questions here in the room? I actually have a question. It's 30 clusters, and you get, you're going to do 7 out of 30. Yep. So the way, um, so it's, it's, they call it a two-stage sampling. And so what they mean is the cluster is the first sample. Um, and like I said, usually that's a census block, and we all know census block can kind of, or census tract can vary in size because it's, you know, number of people um, in that location. And what they returned to us was a map with each cluster on it, um, so one cluster per map, and it had the total number of housing units in that cluster, and you're trying to get seven interviews within a cluster, and so you do the second stage sampling in the field, where you say, okay, well, there's you know, 70 houses in here, and I need seven, so I'm going to go to every 10th house. And you just pick a random start point, and then you just count. So you're trying to get as much representation across your cluster, as well as your cluster hopefully being representative of your community. So it's the two-stage sample. And one of the exciting things about doing these is it really raises the visibility of your agencies, because yeah. you have people knocking on the doors saying, mm -hmm. hi, 
I'm with the local health department or I'm here in collaboration with the weather service. It really mm -hmm. raises the visibility of your agency. Yeah, I would definitely agree to that. Um, we um, had a lot of interest from the media on it. We did put out a press release about it. Um, we had a lot of interest from the media. We did some telephone interviews. Um, they did eventually want to do an on-camera field observation, but because this is human subjects research, we couldn't do that because you're interviewing people about their health and vulnerability, and it's supposed to be confidential. Um, so we weren't able to do that. Um, but we got a lot of positive response about it. Again, I would agree. Um, we all wore our standard public health t-shirts. We have um, work t-shirts that everyone wore. Um, and then for the volunteers, we provided them with vests. Um, that also had our logo on it as well as badges. Um, and several times when we went to homes, over the three days, um, you'd say, oh, we saw you in our neighborhood yesterday. What have you guys been doing? And people would stop you on the street and stuff. I mean, so I agree. It was a big, um, beyond just the data collection, I think it was a good community building activity. Um, and a lot of organizations were interested in hearing about it. Um, and we've gotten a lot of connection with um, our United Way office locally. They're very interested in continuing some of the research that this has started. Um, and we'll also be talking to SRP, which is the Salt River Project, which is one of the um, utility agencies in the valley. Um, so we only have two agencies. We have SRP and then APS, Arizona Public Services. I don't know. I guess I should know what that is. Um, but you know, having one of them on board is really exciting to us that potentially they might be interested in the fact that the cost of electricity is obviously a huge um, contributor to the fact that these people can't take the right steps to protect themselves. So. We have one question online. Um, did you look at the air mass like in the heat event? I'd always heard that swamp coolers, which are maybe used heavily in, in Arizona, um, don't handle moist air mass as well. Uh, especially so, with the summer monsoon. Yeah, so. I would be interested in exploring that more. No, we didn't really look at air mass, but we did collect whether they used a standard air conditioning, whether they used a swamp cooler, or whether they used a window AC um, or some other like portable AC. Um, so the AC that I respond that I presented here is only a standard household-wide AC. Um, it does not include swamp coolers. Um, but I and I I did look at that briefly before I came here, and I do know that there was a difference between the high and low areas as far as what proportion used swamp coolers. Um, but I guess I didn't know that about the air mass. But I would be interested in exploring that. If whoever asked that question. Yeah. Um, they're evaporative coolers, um, so they're household wide usually, but they use evaporation to cool instead of forced air. So what happens is, I had one when I lived in Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. it's a big fan on the top of your, your, your roof, and it sucks the air in over, you know, water, and it boils, and then it cools it down, and then the air that comes into your house is cooler. But when the air mass, it only works if your air mass is dry. So we would know that, yeah. So from the from the survey, since we did ask what what they had and then what they used, um, we should be able to tell that. Um, and again, because it is this two stage sampling, um, you can make community wide estimates. Um, so we can know, you know, an estimate of the number of households covered by this, and then you could multiply that by the number of people per household. Um, so. But whoever asked that question, my contact information is here on the screen. So if you want to email Actually, me, our colleague okay. <laughs> Judy, uh, Judy works in our division. Oh, okay. Great. Any other questions? Okay, so quick comment. Do you have any idea of the importance of my work in California in heat-related issues? One big variable is always the duration of the event, mm -hmm. because as, as you know, you can't cool at night, especially just in cool night. It goes on and on, and it tends to mm -hmm. raise. Uh, mm -hmm. Number of deaths. In addition to that, uh, you're going to run your AC more, mm -hmm. more because of maybe economic issues. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to, and in terms of our messaging, if we had, mm -hmm. you know, this is going to be an extremely mm -hmm. odd but long duration mm -hmm. event. Yeah, I know that the forecast office in Phoenix has worked with um, ASU on looking at both the hospital discharge data and um, the death data to look at overall like time series correlations between 
different temperature measurement methods, and I think um, we did also, they did also look at days of offset, um, you know, offset days. I don't know that they looked at my projects. I don't know if they looked at um, overall duration of like a heat event or anything like that, but my understanding from the last project that they did was they still found that Tmax on an individual day is still the best predictor of morbidity and mortality in our area. Not Tmax. Mm -mm. No, and then we also looked at that using our, um, so they didn't have access to our case report data at that time. They only used um, statewide available vital statistics data, so they didn't have our additional data elements. Um, and then we looked, we did the same thing with our data, um, and we found the same thing, that T-min, we really couldn't find a method where T-min contributed more than any other. Because that was our big thought process, was that, you know, if you do have this cycle of high heat and then no relief of a low overnight, um, that you would build some sort of cumulative effect. And I think I'm pretty, we didn't find that, but I'm open to other suggestions because, I mean, it does make sense to me, but and we haven't found that. Have found that. Mm -hmm. Before we go, I just wanted to add, Dave, you said you've done this after um, hurricane. Yes. And I, I just wanted to know, were there any unique challenges with that um, in terms of populations that are displaced? Um, or maybe they weren't um, going to camp or they can't use it. Certainly, but that's a very good question. The, the timing of when you do these community assessments is, is important. So, for instance, just with the recent um, uh, Casper that we did in that one community that suffered a terrible wildfire in our state, uh, when we did the original Casper three years ago, we, we uh, did it three weeks after the start of the Casper because there was a mandatory evacuation for residents. So we don't do this when uh, there's a mandatory evacuation order because there's no people there, uh, it's not safe. So we, so local jurisdictions we work with to make sure that the, the timing is done appropriately. So we keep that in consideration. I would say that, yeah, I mean, I would say that that was a consideration for us actually in maybe some of our response rate issues as well, where um, the team that had just gone to Napa for the earthquake had a much easier time collecting their um, data because all the people were home from work actually cleaning up from a lot of the storm damage or meeting with insurance assessors and stuff like that, whereas, you know, we, like I said, it was business as usual. We didn't have anything that was causing people to stay home, um, especially during the work week. Um, so that was a challenge for us. Well, what's, yeah. ex what's exciting about mm -hmm. your work is that you can do these taskers at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be in response to a disaster. Uh, for instance, the work that you've described here is trying to assess how do people get messages? How prepared are they? And uh, that's very useful information it for is. local officials. Absolutely. And we, we do service assessments after big events. Mm -hmm. And one of the challenges, because we've been talking about using Casper for a while, but one of the challenges for us is that, particularly after a tornado, a lot of people are displaced. Mm -hmm. right. um, and we have some timing issues, too, with regard to when we can go out and mm -hmm. things like that. But that is safety and things like that. And if they allow you into the community, things like right. that. But, um, it's always kind of been a challenge to go into the community and speak to people who are there and people that are not there. Right? Mm -hmm. right. um, so we've just been trying to think about how we can best use the camp for with our, with our time constraints. Mm -hmm. Right. And working with local mm -hmm. officials and working with local emergency mm -hmm. managers, that would be a great discussion to yeah. try to make sure that uh, mm -hmm. the timing of the cast would be optimal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what kind of questions would you be interested in learning after these events? Is it more about what's going on currently as far as are there resources needed? Is there damage that needs to be assessed? Are there injuries? Or are you really more looking at, I guess, what are you, what would you be maybe interested in? Um, a lot of this is what we do. Response at. to our products, uh, mm -hmm. why people stayed, why, uh, mm -hmm. why people left, what, mm -hmm. could we change the wording within the product? Mm -hmm. and we have a couple of different types of assessments. So the mm -hmm. type that we're involved with is more on our, um, on how well, how quickly we got the product out. What was the yeah. forecast correct? And, mm -hmm. and the forecast office has a different type of assessment. They mm -hmm. get out there very quickly to look at the damage and the assess mm -hmm. how strong the tornado mm -hmm. is. But ours is more service related. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would think that given that though, you might be okay delaying the assessment that you do 
for people to come home or something right. like that because then you might even get more information about, okay, so where did you evacuate to? How long did you stay there? What re did you return? And then, I don't know, maybe you would have to think about whether it's a large scale like Katrina event where people don't return. I mean, yeah. I don't know how you would handle that, but. Um, and that's kind of similar to what I'm thinking about. I know sometimes we have waited um, because we couldn't go into communities, but when we did return, there still were the people yeah. there. Mm -hmm. and it may be because they didn't choose to come back or they just, mm -hmm. they're much more ready to come back too. Mm -hmm. the, the neat thing with Casper, uh, as you mentioned, Kate, is you can assess knowledge, attitude, and mode of behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and that really provides you some good, accurate mm -hmm. information about the community that you serve. Yeah, and you might have, obviously, you guys know your limitations better about, you know, resources and authority and all that kind of stuff, but you might consider doing something proactive in an area that you know is prone to storms and say, what would your practices be for evacuating? What would your tipping points be, you know, for whether you would shelter in place, whether you would evacuate, you know? That's a great idea. That's mm -hmm. awesome because I think that our, our field offices are often looking for that information. Mm -hmm. and you know, after an event, while we go in nationally, mm -hmm. our local offices kind of have some of that information mm -hmm. beforehand. So we can even kind of do a baseline and see if they're mm -hmm. And even as we're looking at our heat assessments, um, looking at our heat watch warnings and advisories, mm -hmm. maybe a proactive approach to, mm -hmm. um, or even after a huge heat wave, to come mm -hmm. in and do a CASPER and see mm -hmm. how people got their information and what it meant to mm -hmm. them. What, what information would be of interest to you in, in drought community? communities that are suffering throughout. Are there specific questions that you would like answers to as it relates to their water use um, habits or anything like that or uh, anything that comes to mind? Well, actually, that, now that you mentioned we don't have a national hydrology meeting in a couple of weeks. They probably would. Okay. So I'm not speaking from person any expertise in hydrology, but okay. I'm sure that they would be interested in some of that information. Well, so just a really big um, California drought assessment done by a different part of NOAA. Um, it's just published, I think, like last week. We weren't part of it, but I can get you the name and probably a link to it. That's interesting. Yeah, that would be helpful. I was, I was part of that oh, okay. assessment. And this is the first assessment that Noah did that actually was multidisciplinary. So we went to the patient impacts, we looked at human beings and farmers and everybody else. And so as a consequence, it becomes a big effort. Yeah. Big right. And I think it's very instructional for us to, to know who we are talking to. Because sometimes you go and talk with the individuals who are water resource managers. And they have a very different perspective mm -hmm. of what it is that you are provided that was useful or not useful. So one of the questions we had, is this product that we produce useful? And the fellow said, he's a director. He said it's very nice, but it's useless for us. And so you need to understand this. You know, what it is that they need to control. But I have a question about, uh, you mentioned something about knowledge. Do you expect individuals to, let's say, know the difference between a symptom and a syndrome related to heat impact? So we, we didn't get into those weeds. Um, you know, we just asked that first open-ended question about do you know any effects. We didn't even say signs or symptoms. We said, do you know any effects you can get from exposure to high heat? So again, it wasn't the sun, it was the high heat. Um, and we, it was just an open field. And we just literally wrote down whatever they said. But then we did ask the next question where we said, um, during the past summer, did anyone in your household experience any of these symptoms? And we gave them a list of, you know, dizziness, headaches, nausea, leg cramps, weakness, any, you know, the symptoms of heat illness, um, and then asked them. Yes or no? Yeah, this is the problem we have. Uh -huh. Rural communities who are suffering from the toxins in the air to kind of the harmful level. Mm -hmm. People have no clue mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. So we just don't feel good. Yeah. And they could not feel good 
because of winter reasons. Mm -hmm. But so that's a very difficult thing to learn about. What's bothering them? Whether it's really these options in the air, or whether it's just atmospheric conditions that they already have. Mm -hmm. But these are difficult, difficult questions in these kinds of interviews and mm -hmm. surveys. Mm -hmm. You mentioned something about the first um, death of the child in uh -huh. the car. So did you have any question to, uh, to see the, the to question them to see if they have a knowledge of the dangers of, uh, of so for a lot of these deaths, um, we don't actually get a chance to interview the family. Um, we rely on the medical examiner and their death, invest death scene investigators to interview the family. Um, and we receive information from them. Um, I don't know if they ask that question, but I can ask. Do you, do you actually include them as um, heat-related deaths? We do. Uh -huh, yeah, so all the hot car deaths, um, any of that kind of thing, we do include as heat-related deaths. All right, I know we're a few minutes uh, over. Any questions over there, Jenna, on the web? Nope? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us, and thanks again to our public health colleagues, David and um, Kate, for coming by to speak with us. And um, I think everyone has my contact information if you need anything, and Kate's is here on the um, on the web. So. Um,